Father, you have told us that it is more blessed to give than to receive, and we thank you for the blessings now of giving to you, you who have given so much to us in Christ. Use these gifts for the glory of your great name, for we pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Let's turn in our Bibles to Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 to 31. If you're using our Pew Bibles, that's on page 1245, continuing our way through Paul's letters, letter to the Galatians. This morning coming to the final passage in Galatians 4, which is in many ways the climax of the argument he's been making through chapters 3 and 4. He's talking to us about our sonship in Christ and here he comes to the climax of that argument. It is also generally acknowledged to be by far the most complex passage in Galatians, um, which you will see as I am reading. But pay attention closely. I trust that by God's grace and his spirit, uh, by the end of the sermon, it will be, it will be more clear and less unclear um, as we see what God is saying to us. Uh, in his word. So let's give our attention here to God's word. Galatians 4, beginning at verse 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. Amen. May the Lord bless this reading of his word. Let's ask his blessing in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you even for passages like this one, difficult. Uh, and we thank you that you have given even these passages to us for our growth in grace, that our love for Christ would, would grow and that we would magnify your name in our lives. So do that in our midst this morning, we pray. Open our hearts to receive this word in Jesus' name. Amen. There I was at the optometrist, reclining in the doctor's leather chair, listening to the terrible music that doctor's offices always play, and gazing across the room at that white screen that's on the wall. You know that white screen. It's the one that has all the blurry letters on it. Well, <clears throat> this time, there was a single sailboat on that white screen. And... Uh, the doctor dropped a few lenses in front of my eyes and he said, now you see two sailboats, right? I said, no, just one. He said, oh dear, that's not good. <laughs> it's never good when your doctor says, oh dear, that's not good. But uh, he flipped a few more lenses in front of my eyes and then finally I saw two sailboats. His goal, of course, was not to get me to see in double. His goal was the opposite. It was to get me to see in brilliant, singular vision. And Paul is doing something like that here at the end of Galatians 4. He is splitting our vision in two. 
Uh, he splits the whole world into two categories. Everybody in the world is either a slave or they are free. Everyone in the world is either an Ishmael or they are an Isaac. Now you remember here the context that we're in in Galatians. If you've been here uh, for the months past, we seen that Paul preached the gospel in Galatia. And uh, many churches were established in Galatia. They loved the gospel and they loved Paul and he loved them. But then after Paul left, false teachers came in to Galatia from Jerusalem. And they said, Paul did not tell you the whole gospel. Yes, you need to believe in Jesus Christ, but you also need to obey these laws of Moses if you're going to be saved. And uh, it was a disaster. People started to throw away the gospel. They started to throw away their freedom in Christ. The Galatians started to do things like get circumcised because they thought they had to in order to be saved. They started to celebrate Old Testament festivals like Passover because they thought they had to in order to be saved. But they weren't being saved. They were being enslaved. And uh, Paul here is confronting this. We need to hear this as much as the Galatians did because it is so easy for us to do the same thing. Listen to how Phil Riken comments. He says, we often forget that Christianity is a form of liberty, not slavery. We can so often reduce faith in Christ to a list of rules or traditions, and we evaluate our spiritual standing and that of others by what we do rather than what God has done for us. In truth, Riken says, we are all recovering Pharisees. We are all prone to look back to the law for our standing with God. But Paul has been confronting this over and over in Galatians uh, to this point. And here, like I said, is somewhat of the climax of his argument. Also, one of the most difficult parts of his argument. What Paul is doing here in our passage in Galatians 4 is he is arguing like a rabbi would argue. This is the kind of argument that the rabbis would have with one another. It's a tightly wound Old Testament argument. But it begins here uh, with some sarcasm that I think we can all appreciate. Verse 21, he asks, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? In other words, if you were really listening to the law, you would realize that the law itself tells you not to live under the law. Now, where does the law say that? Well, that's where Paul leads us here. Back into the Old Testament, into the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 21 we read earlier, but other chapters like chapter 18 as well, that tell us the story of Abraham's two sons. Isaac and Ishmael. And he goes to that passage probably because he wants to meet the false teachers on their own turf. Probably the false teachers were saying, we're the real sons of Abraham. We are the, the children in the line of Isaac, and we can tell you how to be true sons of Abraham as well. Just do all these laws that we are putting before you. But Paul flips it on them here. Paul shows that those false teachers with their false teaching are showing that they are actually in the line of Ishmael, not in the line of Isaac. They are not the sons of freedom. They are the sons of slavery. They are not the true sons of inheritance. Now you have to realize that this argument Paul is making would have been like a bombshell in the churches in Galatia. And uh, we need that bomb to explode in our hearts if we are really going to understand uh, and appreciate the real wonder of the gospel of grace uh, and if we're never going to go back to slavery again. So Paul here makes this argument here in three logical steps. The first 
is where he takes us back into the Old Testament. He shows us the historical situation with Ishmael and Isaac. Then he goes on, second of all, to give us an allegorical interpretation of that history. Basically, he shows us how it points to the gospel. Then last of all, he gives us a practical application of what that gospel will do in our lives, how it will shape us as the children of God. And so we're going to look at it in those three parts together. First of all, let's see what this historical situation is that Paul points us to. Verse 22 and 23, he says, For it is written, Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through the promise. God had promised Abraham that he would be the father of a great multitude, the father of a nation. But things were not going very well. Uh, he had no children. His wife had passed menopause. And he himself was 80 years old. Uh, we would be a little surprised here at Calvary if a couple like this showed up on our weekly prayer list in the expecting mothers section. I mean, we wouldn't just put a mother like this on the expecting mothers list. It would be extraordinary. This was a, a signal act of God. And so it wasn't happening for Abram and Sarah. And it was very hard for them as many of you know who have had trouble having children, that you can feel desperate in that situation. And, uh, and in feeling desperate, Abraham and Sarah, instead of trusting God, they decided to take matters into their own hands. What did they do? Um, Abraham would have a child with Sarah's slave woman, Hagar. You can almost hear the conversation around their dinner table. God promised to give us a child. It's not happening. Let's make it happen. And so that's what they did. They made it happen. And a son was born, and he was named Ishmael. Now, how would you describe that way of living uh, under God's promises? One person comments, when Abraham got Hagar pregnant, he was operating on the principle that God helps those who help themselves. This is man-made religion. This is man-dependent religion. I'll get the promises, and I'll get them even if I have to grab onto them. J.I. Packer says, Abraham was playing the amateur providence. Never a good way to live your life. But Ishmael was not the son of promise. God did give them a son. Abraham and Sarah had a son beyond their wildest expectation. God gave them a son when Sarah was 90 years old, and they named him Isaac, which means laughter, you remember, because when God told Sarah that she was going to have a son, she laughed. She thought it was the funniest thing she ever heard, and so would we, because it's beyond all human expect expectation. God's promise always comes that way. It, it shows that he alone is the one who gives the power and the grace. So here's what we're supposed to see. See this contrast, that even though Isaac and Ishmael have the same biological father, otherwise they couldn't be more different from one another. Think of their differences. One difference is, uh, is between, between Isaac and Ishmael is in their status under the law. Ishmael, Paul tells us, was born a slave because his mother was a slave. That might sound harsh to you, but that's how the law worked. And Isaac, on the other hand, was born free because his mother, Sarah, was free. They had a different status. Another significant difference that Paul brings out is the manner in which these two sons were born. Paul says in verse 23, Ishmael was born according to the flesh. That is to say, he was born in the normal way that babies are born. Abraham laid with, with Hagar and she got pregnant. That's how babies are born. But Isaac's birth 
was different. Uh, there was no human reason that Abraham and Sarah should have ever expected to have children at that age. And that's why Paul says Isaac was born through the promise. Not by the flesh, but through the promise. And then down in verse 29, he says that Isaac was born according to the Spirit. That is, by the power of God. This was not a natural birth. It was supernatural. It was by God's power and promise that Isaac came into the world. So you, you see the contrast here? One son born by faith in human efforts. Another son born by faith in God's promise. One son born a slave. The other son born free. And having established that historical situation, Paul now says, let me tell you how this is a picture of the gospel. That's what he goes on next to talk about in his allegorical interpretation. Verse 24, he says, now this may be interpreted allegorically. What is an allegory? One of the most famous ones for Christians is John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. An allegory is uh, a story where the people and the places and the events uh, stand for deeper spiritual truths. Now, oftentimes Christians get nervous about talking about interpreting the Bible allegorically because it can rip uh, the, the passage out of context and make the history not matter at all. That's not what Paul's doing here. Paul, uh, Paul isn't saying that the history doesn't matter. It's real history. Uh, Isaac and Ishmael were real sons born in real time to real mothers to a real father Abraham. And yet, as Paul looks at that story, he says... You can see the gospel here. There's a deeper spiritual reality pictured in this of how God's grace works. Now to understand it, to understand the allegory, you have to see in double. You gotta let Paul be the optometrist here because our vision's split in two over and over again. There's two mothers, there's two covenants, there's two mountains, there's two Jerusalems, and there's two sons in the end. So let's begin with the two mothers, Hagar and Sarah. Paul says these two mothers represent two different covenants. Hagar was, is a picture of the old covenant, the covenant that God gave to Moses at Mount Sinai that said, if you obey, you will be blessed. And if you disobey, you will be cursed. And Paul has been saying all along in Galatians that, that that's a good covenant. That, that covenant was meant to lead us to the Lord Jesus Christ and to depend on him. But if you depend on that law covenant for salvation, you're going to be a slave. The law was meant to lead you to the gospel. And Hagar is a perfect picture of the law because when she and Ishmael were sent away from Abram and Sarah, where, would, where did they go? Do you remember? They went into Arabia, which is where Mount Sinai is, which is where God gave the law to his people. So you can see how Paul aligned all of these things uh, with, uh, with Hagar. But here Paul goes one step further and he says, Hagar corresponds to the present Jerusalem. He is talking there about the Jews in his day, most of whom lived in Jerusalem. And he is saying they are living as slaves. They're living as Ishmael's. They're living as children of Hagar because they're depending on the law as a way to be right with God and be saved. And that is slavery. But Sarah is different. Sarah represents the new covenant, the covenant of promise that God announced to Abraham. In that covenant, as we've seen, uh, God said, I will do everything to bring this to pass. Uh, I guarantee everything in this covenant by my promise. You remember, Abraham had nothing to do with the covenant God made with him. He uh, was knocked out in sleep. And God passed through those halved animals. Uh, God was saying, I'll take care of it all. Even if I have to die, I 
will keep my promises. It's all based on grace. And this covenant, Paul says, corresponds to a different Jerusalem, the Jerusalem above. When Paul speaks of the Jerusalem above, he's speaking about the heavenly Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. He's speaking of heaven, uh, what, re what the book of Revelation speaks about. It is, uh, it's the home of all of God's children. It's the better country that even Abraham was looking forward to. And we're going to sing later this morning, Jerusalem the Golden. It's the land of sacred liberty and endless rest. And uh, so there is a complete contrast here that Paul is making uh, between Hagar and her children and Sarah and hers. Children of slavery, like Ishmael, are born by man's power. They're born by man's efforts by man's works and man's ingenuity. But children of freedom like Isaac are born by God's power. They're born by God's promise. They are born by God's grace and God's gospel alone. Paul highlights this even more here if you look down at verse 27. Uh, in verse 27, he quotes from Isaiah chapter 54, verse 1 which says, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now, why does Paul make that quote here? It's a fascinating quote for him to make. On the one hand, it seems obviously related to Sarah. She was barren. And God's saying here, he gives children to the barren. But on the other hand, it's interesting because when Isaiah, when he first wrote this prophecy, he wasn't talking about Sarah. He was talking about Israel when they were in exile in Babylon. And you could say that in exile, Israel was barren. They were fruitless. They were hopeless. They didn't see any future for themselves. But in that context, God came to them through Isaiah and he made this amazing promise that even though you are barren, even though you are hopeless, one day you will have more children than a woman who is fertile and has a husband. I am going to bring you out of exile. I'm going to bring you out of death. I'm going to bring you back into Jerusalem. I'm going to rebuild that city. And I'm going to populate that city with innumerable children who are born again by my power and my grace. What a promise for God to give to his people. When will we see this promise come to pass? We're seeing it right now. Right now. As the gospel goes forward around the, the world, men and women, boys and girls, hear the gospel of God's grace and they come to faith in Christ. And at that moment, they are made children of promise and they are made citizens of the heavenly Jerusalem. It is a city above that is growing and we're a part of it. People are joining it every day from every nation and tribe in the world. People have joined it from times before us, and they will join it from times after us as well. And every person that comes into that city God is populating are born again by His power and by His grace. It's how everyone becomes a child of God, just like Isaac. You don't become a child of God because you do something right or you grasp after God's blessing or you figure out how to get a hold of it yourself. You receive God's blessing and his promises because it comes to you through his sovereign power and his grace in the gospel that gives you new birth into the kingdom of God. Do you agree that that's how you have come into the kingdom of God? Remember when John the Baptist was uh, speaking to the Jews in his day? John the Baptist was a really bold guy. He said lots of things that I would uh, tremble to say. On one occasion, he said to the Jews, Do not say to me that you have Abraham for your father. 
For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these very stones. And that is how every child of Abraham has been born. Through the sovereign grace, the supernatural grace of God. That's who we are. We're the Isaacs, born by promise, born according to the Spirit. All of God's grace and power. That is our status as those who've been brought into the kingdom. And it's a glorious status. But it's also a status that shapes our lives. And that is what Paul goes on to speak about last of all here, when he gives the practical application of this good news of the gospel. Now, to this point, we've seen in double a lot, but now things do start to come into singular focus. Verse 28, Paul says, Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. Okay, for all the confusing verses in this text, this one is very clear. You are Isaacs. You are children of promise. What an amazing thing for Paul to say for a church that was full of Gentiles. He's saying, take heart. Don't listen to what the false teachers are telling you. You're not Ishmael's. You are Isaac's. It doesn't matter if you are biologically descended from Abraham. What matters is that you are born of the Spirit of God by the promise and power of God. That is how the power of the gospel always works, isn't it? From beginning to end. The gospel is either supernatural or it is nothing at all. If it's not supernatural, we have no reason to be here. The gospel is supernatural from beginning to end. Even, even the gospel was brought to us in Christ, the Son of God, who also was born, not of the will of the flesh, but by the will of God and the overshadowing power of the Holy Spirit. And so also are all who are born in him as well. We are born as God's children through his supernatural works, through his sin-bearing death, through his death-defeating resurrection. We become Isaac's children of promise because, in a sense, Jesus became an Ishmael. He was sent away into exile into the barren wilderness of the cross. And there he bore all of our sins so that we might receive new birth that comes in him. Paul's saying here, this is how new birth always comes. Not by what you do, not by doing what other people tell you you need to do, but through God's power alone. Praise him. This is the good news of the gospel. But that good news will shape us. And how will that supernatural grace shape us? I want us to look at three things here as we close this morning. First of all, <clears throat> because you are an Isaac, you must live in dependence not on yourself, but on God's supernatural grace. It's not just for the beginning of your life. It's for every day of your life as well. You see, <clears throat> when Abraham had that child with Hagar, you could say he was living by faith. He was living by faith in himself. But God works his promise when we abandon hope in ourselves, when we abandon our self-reliance and rely on his grace alone. And that is a truth to shape our lives and to shape our whole church here as well. Who you are and what you do is not by your own strength, but in total dependence on God's. Who we are as Calvary Church and what we do as Calvary Church will not be done in our own strength, but in total dependence on God's. That is the only way that it will be all to his glory, right? We will never do anything fruitful for the gospel apart from relying on the sovereign power 
of God in the gospel. And that truth, brothers and sisters, if we really believe it, will drive us to our knees in prayer, and then we will see the God of Abraham and Sarah work powerfully in our midst. So that's the first thing. Because you're an Isaac, because we are all Isaacs, we live in dependence on God's supernatural grace. Second of all, because you're an Isaac, you must know and expect that you will face persecution in this life. Paul draws this out in verse 29. He says, The son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born according to the spirit, and so also it is now. Ishmael persecuted Isaac. The false teachers persecuted the Galatians. And so it will still be today that we who are those who depend upon the sovereign grace of God alone, we will face persecution from those who don't love God's grace alone. And so we should expect it. But we should also know that we can endure. And why? Because third of all, as Isaacs, we know that we will receive the inheritance. Verse 30 says, but what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. Whatever we face in this life, our inheritance is before us. Heaven stands before us. Christ is preparing a place for us. And so that means that whatever we face in this life, whatever persecution, whatever pain, whatever sorrow, we press on in faith. We're able to do that because of what is laid before us. One theologian named Arthur Pink wrote these words. He wrote, here is what faith is invited to do to place on one scale the present afflictions of this life and to place on the other scale eternal glory. Are they worthy to be compared, he says? Certainly not. One second of glory will more than counterbalance a whole lifetime of suffering. What are years of toil, of sickness, of poverty and persecution, even of a martyr's death, when weighed against the pleasures at God's right hand forevermore. Friends, that is the perspective that is given to us as those who are true heirs of God in Christ. So I encourage you, brothers and sisters, let's see who we are as the spirit-born children of God. Let, let Paul take you to the eye doctor. Let him split your vision in two just for a moment so that you can see with renewed singular clarity who you really are. A child of promise. Don't doubt it. Delight in it. And since it is true, don't ever go back to the slavery of self-reliance. Let's live, let's live by God's power. Let's live trusting in his promises. Let's be ready to endure persecution that may come. And let's set our hearts on the inheritance that is laid before us when at last we will enter the new Jerusalem with all of God's children of promise, every one of whom has been born again by the sovereign grace of God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your grace to us in Christ. We thank you that you've made us what we could never be on our own, children of, of promise and children of grace. May we live with the freedom and with the power and with the joy that you give to your children. May we be May we, may we be full of, of wonder at all that is ours in Christ. And we pray this in his precious name. Amen. Let's sing God's praises together as we come to the Lord's table. He